Good evening, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us this Friday evening to have this very, very important conversation. Um, this Wednesday, the world observed Press Freedom Day, a day that's supposed to mark the vital role that a free press plays in our democracies. And it was also the day that the World Press Freedom Index was released by Reporters Without Borders. Uh, this year, India has slipped down 11 ranks, becoming number 161 out of the 180 countries that were ranked on the basis of their media freedom. Um, we're here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the state of press freedom in India today. Uh, and today I also have the distinct honor of introducing our speakers, T.M. Krishna and Gautam Bhatia. Uh, T.M. Krishna is a Carnatic musician, author, and activist. He has authored six books and published numerous articles on a range of issues related to the arts, culture, society, and politics. He was awarded the Raman Magasese Award in 2016 in recognition of his commitment to the arts as a force for social good. Uh, Gautam Bhatia is a constitutional law scholar, lawyer, author, and IFF of counsel. He's written four books and writes regularly for leading newspapers. Thank you so much to the both of you for being here today with us. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty of actually kicking off this conversation by first asking about your thoughts on India's ranking in the World Press Freedom Index. Uh, TM Krishna, sir, would you like to go first? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and Gautam, it's great to meet you. Big admirer of all your work and read you very often. So it's a pleasure to have this uh, conversation with you on this day. I mean, um, the index is an important indicator uh, without doubt. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, but we should not be very surprised by what we are reading in the index. But I think it's also important to... Um, these numbers are important, definitely, but it's also important to think about how aware we are of what this freedom is. What does it really mean? Press freedom, and I want to extend it. It's not just the press. It's freedom of citizens, um, freedom of artists, of everybody, every one of us having this conversation. And has it, how it has slid over the years. And the scarier part is how much we've normalized the slide. We have normalized the fact that it's okay if you cannot uh, speak with abandon. And I'm saying abandon in a very positive manner, in a very um, uh, enforced manner, uh, personally, I mean, individually uh, free. And the fact that we feel it's okay, it's okay to be shut down, it's okay to be abused, it is okay that you cannot say what you want. You can't even think in a certain manner. It is okay if the state feels it can infringe upon your privacy. The fact that we think this is fine, and I, I, I hope there are a lot of people who don't think it is fine, but I think it's also true a lot of people think it is fine somewhere. And it's got to do with our education, our schooling system, this whole idea of discipline that we are often spoken about when we are children. And I think it's important for us to reflect on the various cultural aspects of our being as citizens that is, in a way, participatory to the slide and our normalization of the slide and our normalization of the acts of the state. Um, so I think I would like to broaden uh, the conversation beyond just a numerical fact. But very bluntly put, I'm not at all surprised. And Gautam, what about you? What are your thoughts on the rankings? Yeah, I think that uh, that the rankings uh, reflect something that we've been experiencing, I think, uh, over the last few years. And um, when you speak of of press freedom or the idea of, of press freedom, I think there are, there are two aspects to it. Uh, one, of course, is the is what's easier to see, which is the web of legal rules and regulations that are acts of the state and that uh, constrain what the press can can do and can't do. So, you know, of of late, what we have seen is weaponization of of various laws. Uh, defamation is is one that is a fairly common tool that's used against the press, uh, various sections in the Indian Penal Code, 295A, the blasphemy provision, 153A of the IPC, the 
um you know the, the stirring up enmity between classes things like that so so there is of course the very obvious uh, heavy hand of law and the way that law is is deployed to uh, to to achieve the goals of of censorship and uh, and part of it of course is visible but part of it is what what we call the chilling effect or self censorship that is that the knowledge that these laws exist and that that they will be used Um, is something that that uh, has an effect where people end up self censoring and st- and they end up steering so clear of the the line between what is actually lawful and unlawful that they end up self censoring a broad range of of what is even under these laws uh, lawful speech because who wants to take the risk of you know of, of getting getting hauled up and uh, and spending time going court to court with uncertain outcomes uh because i think as we've seen recently with the defamation case of rahul gandhi although that isn't a press freedom case uh you may think that you know the 101 of defamation inside out and then suddenly a judgment will come that will upend everything you thought you knew about the law so there so i think there is a, a point right now in indian law that nobody can with any confidence predict that this is what the law is and this is how a court will apply it there is no certainty in that sense when it comes to these kinds of cases because we are seeing like new law being made on the hoof uh, and then of course i think that it's impos- important to know that the way the law is weaponized specifically in places that are um, you know in places like kashmir during the internet shutdown in other places in 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 places in the northeastern states uh, patricia mukhim was somebody you know who has been really persecuted so you also have have places in the geographical sort of you know parts of the country where they are these laws operate you know uh, even in a stricter way than they operate in in other places so that's i think one aspect and the second aspect is it's the non legal aspect but it's equally constricting and, and this refers to things like ownership structures uh, you know who owns the press because a lot of what is published and what isn't published and therefore what constitutes press freedom depends on on the editorial line and that in turn depends on where the funding comes from and who owns the press uh, i think in that sense if we look at ownership structures um concentration of 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 press ownership which is a problem that is across the world whether it's murdoch outside or or you know here with our own local barons uh there is that sense of of gra- gradual sort of like uh movement towards a certain kind of conformity in what is covered and how it's covered and what is not that is traceable to directly to ownership of the press so i think that these two in these two senses we we see a uh, gradual change over the years in terms of declining press freedom which is now reflected in in the rankings uh so i think it's really interesting uh team krishna sir you mentioned um the culture that you think has contributed to this slide and gautam spoke about the chilling effect uh team krishna sir how do you think do you think those two things are the same do you think the chilling effect is part of the culture and that the culture is something larger than that how do you think those two aspects uh work together well it's interesting you know i, I was just going to take up uh, that word you know chilling effect um it's interesting for i mean as a person i'm 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 dressing this from the sphere of culture in a larger sense is first of all how many people sense this as a chilling effect you know let's let's ask that question right um gautam and i may feel it's a chilling effect you may feel it so for many people maybe there's no chilling effect i mean i'm just raising this as an as a philosophical point is that if the constriction becomes something that we have normalized this constriction of thought and you must realize and what is you know feeling that you don't want to ex- say something or express something you don't want to be hauled up in court and and also if i add to what gautam said it's not just the court you don't want to be also beaten up let's also talk about that that everything is not coming directly from a law or or a police station you don't want people to be coming and hitting you or you're scared for your family and so if this whole social mechanism of censorship of infringing upon your physical mental emotional psychological space to be to just be uh is in a way normalized you maybe don't even feel that there is this idea of the chilling effect 
and i'm sometimes concerned that many time maybe we are somewhere there uh you know somewhere there in the way we feel it and say what's the big deal and so when some people come and argue that you know of course you have many inane arguments uh, comparing india to the worst places in the world which i've never understood why but that kept aside when people come and argue i mean you're saying what you want right uh, you're not i sometimes wonder whether one that could be frivolous but it also could come from a place where you not being able to think something or not being able to for my in my case say sing something is not something that is considered an infringement of any sort so this then extends to larger question of what do we believe in as being a democracy uh it asks those kind of constitutional questions that what do we mean by saying we live in a democratic country and i'm asking this what is what is the culture of democracy therefore the chilling effect is directly connected or the feeling of it or the lack of it or not feeling it is connected to our sense of democracy at a personal social and at a political level and that's i think a deeper question that we need to inquire about it's not just an intellectual question it's a question of everybody and i may add this like you know we talk about the rahul gandhi case we talk about many other cases but let's remember that the worst affected by all these webs of laws and social violence and goons and this rowdyism and this uncertainty are the most vulnerable people in this country these are the people who are the margins and various kinds of margins gautam spoke about the north east spoke about kashmir we're talking about dalits we're talking about the muslim community we're talking about people who are on the margins and many of those names and many of those incidents may not even come to light we not, may not even know about it so and if you if you in a way come from uh marginalizations of various sort then there are many kinds of social violences that are normalized by society on you that you, the normalization that you should not say certain things the normalization for certain communities that they should not walk in certain streets the normalization that you know we still have uh caste intercaste marriage violences the normalization that you have separate graveyards i mean let's i'm just trying to connect this to the normalization of various kinds of violence because i think it is connected to a lack of what i may call what i may just overarchingly call a uh, democratic culture and which is why i think we seem to be the state and its tentacles of operators seem to be getting away with what is happening today and as gautam said we can't even believe we also i mean i would like also it also seems like in the judiciary we don't know what to expect so this overall uncertainty is part i think of a kind of a violent culture something that is we should really be concerned about uh so i want to highlight uh, kind of in continuation of this conversation about violence i want to highlight one of the most alarming statistics uh, that was mentioned that was mentioned in the RSF index that each year on average three or four journalists in india are killed in relation to their work and just recapping what's been happening since 2023 began uh, the government banned uh, the bbc documentary india the modi question the income tax department has surveyed uh, the bbc offices and this included seizing employees personal uh, devices the adani group took over ndtv which was another worrying development in the decline of media pluralism in india the government notified the it rules uh, the it amendment rules 2023 which created a government appointed fact check unit that has the power to censor online content there's been over 25 internet shutdowns since the year began um so you've talked about how this creates this kind of normalization of violence and um and sort of destroys the democratic culture gotham what do you think this kind of environment means for journalists how does it affect our democracy yeah i think i think two things right so one one taking on from um what uh, what tm krishna sir said it's, it's it's i think this works both ways right so in in the uh, it, it is no, one of course is that this sort of conformity or the sense that there is that one doesn't even feel a chilling effect um is is normalized in part because of what one sees around oneself and and so if if one sees for instance that 
I, you know what one consumes in the media or or reads in the newspapers um you know or, or sees is in any case uh, a sort of unquestioning conformity uh, then one will feel that that is the normal right so in that sense one will one will um, not think there's a chilling effect or that there is any problem uh so th- so and so that and that in turn then feeds into you know uh the uh, what these said news channels or newspapers do so i think that it, it's it's both ways in the sense that the restrictive legal regime uh creates the creates a certain kind of enforced conformity and then that enforced conformity has like a force multiplier effect where given that that's what you see around you uh you don't think that you do think that is the normal right so you if you don't see authority getting challenged in the media uh then you think that a non challenged authority is the way that that it's meant to be so i think that that that, that is sort of the, the two feed off each other uh now as far as as the next question which is that these developments you know what what do they portend for for journalists so i think i mean it's quite obvious right so uh i mean in some ways it's a very physical impediment on journalists not being able to to do their job in in the internet shutdown is sort of literally physically a restriction on the ability of a, of a journalist to to do their job and other such um such you know uh, physical restraints and we come to i think more subtle or insidious uh, restraints and i think there's something like what you said uh, the uh, the i the new it rules are uh, are are important because you know the justification of that actually is couched in democratic terms right it's couched in in the fact that fake news is as dangerous and that's something you know we all agree on it's couched in the language of you know the importance of fact checking uh fake news and and preventing the the viral spread of of fake news and again there's something we all agree with in principle um and and then the remedy though of course is that it is the government sponsored uh fact checker that does this so it's effectively the the government that in relation to matters involving the government uh, is or becomes the arbiter of what of what truth is um and that of course and the reason why that is is dangerous in a more insidious way is that that as we all know um there are many or a wide range of of statements or or propositions or or things you say uh that don't strictly fall within a true or false binary to which the category of true or false is is simply inapplicable and we see that that vexed question a lot in in defamation law and when judges have for the last 100 years been breaking their heads over uh, whether a particular statement actually is in a matter of opinion or if it can actually even be classified as true or false um and and with that level of complexity you now have like the the government effectively becoming the deciding authority on that uh and then of course that again ensures that with that hanging over your head um as as a journalist as someone who reports on the government uh knowing that that you know what you say is going to pass through a government sponsored body deciding if it's true or false um is obviously going to directly affect the way you work and and you know the way you report so i think that is a particularly uh, dangerous move is new rules are, are particularly dangerous when it comes to the ability of journalists to challenge the government you know and to to question government claims uh, in in a way that that is that is free and and you know possible uh i think that's a really interesting point and um i think what's really interesting is that uh, the government and the media have always had a unique relationship in that uh, we expect the media to hold the government accountable but at the same time the statistics show us that you know the government is one of the largest advertisers uh, with the media today um so given that now we have these new rules coming into place uh, we also have a much more sophisticated government media machinery how would you like to uh, tm krishna sir would you like to comment on how you think the relationship between the media and the government has changed uh, in the past few years well um i think as it was laid out um ownership is a very important aspect of it uh that's uh, definitely w- something we, we we are watching happening unfolding or unfolded uh maybe it's a past tense right now because it all seems to have uh, capitulated in some manner uh so it's the media it's the 
corporate uh, honcho and it's you have the government. So it's kind of this web between the three. Uh, but there is also, again, uh, this this culture of wanting to always please the boss. And I don't think this is only coming from the ownership pattern. It is also coming from, I think, uh, a lot of what I would put within courts, well-known media names. Uh, this constant need to you almost at times <laughs> feel we live in some kind of a monarchy that uh, you know, you need to be praising the king, you need to be praising the zamindar. Today, we seem to have media people who are constantly praising uh, politicians in great seats of power. And this may happen, they may, some may claim it's happening in private capacity on their social media handles, but sometimes it is happening out there at public events. Uh, and I think all these are very, very worrisome because the questions that are being asked by the media to uh, political people are sometimes so obviously designed. It's like you already know the answer to the question. So difficult questions are not being asked. Of course, the fact that uh, our prime minister has not given a media interview for the last what eight years is something that has to be laid out when we are discussing this relationship. You're most welcome to infer whatever you want from that. Um, but the, f the very fact that that doesn't seem to bother a lot of the media, that you have a prime minister who has not given an interview, uh, and I mean a non-curated interview. And you also have the press who want to constantly say that, you know, this is about India. The other conflation that the press has been actively participating and exaggerating um, and falsely placing in the minds of people is that a political party is the country. And this this total cloud of Indian pride versus party pride or the support to a party or an individual becomes a support to the country. So if the media and especially if it is say the BBC or somebody else asking very, very important, difficult questions, you're most welcome to disagree with what is being said. You're most welcome to argue it. But then to make the defense that this is an attack on India, every question that is asked of the government or of a political party has now been transformed into a challenge of India or a questioning of India. And in this, we have to say the media has played and is playing an active role. And this should worry every one of us. Even those who agree with this idea of India should be worried by that. Because there's the same media that tomorrow can flip it and think that some other idea of India that some other political party uh, flaunts should be again pampered. So we have, a, we almost have a continuation of casteist feudalism, if I can call it that, in the way media and the government and media and political parties are behaving. And that is very, very concerning uh, for, again, culturally, on what kind of culture we are developing. But I want to uh, end with asking actually Gautam a question. Um, and I, I don't know uh, whether chilling effect is the right word, but I'm going to use it anyway. We're talking about the chilling effect in mul multiple public spaces. We're talking about the effect of that. Uh, in a, I can talk about it as an artist. And, and let me just say that before I continue. You know, it does exist. Let me just bluntly say that. I do think twice when I want to sing something. I do think twice about a new song that maybe have, have a political connotation. And I'm not thinking twice because... I'm engaging with that word or with that that phrase uh, on a philosophical basis for myself or my own political position. But I'm starting to think, oh, my God, what may happen? That is the chilling effect. That's when my, I can't create. That's when I can't see a piece of art. That's when I am questioning myself. And that's very, very troublesome. And if a person with as much privilege as I am saying this, just imagine what is happening to many people who have so many things to say. And my question to Gotham is, how much has this change in culture, change in laws, change in the way the media and uh, government relate with each other, media and political parties uh, you know, relate with each other, affected the atmosphere in courts? Uh, is there a chilling effect in the court? Or is there a chilling effect before you get to court? Is there something, and I'm talking about all sides of the court, how do you think this has actually influenced the culture within 
the court and that's my question to gautam um yeah i think that um, it's so i think you, you have to look at this in in alongside the, the fact that there's been that ri- the rise in in live tweeting from court and um, you know um, and uh, and live streaming as well now so on the one hand uh, you have greater sort of so to say transparency and publicity of court proceedings and on the other hand you know you have all of what we've been discussing so far and i think that has led to um, you know a sort of very yeah strange kind of a um, you know confluence of two opposing impulses but the result of it is that that uh, people think a lot more uh, carefully about how they are pitching something in court given this broader context and i'll give you an example uh, which comes from the same sex marriage case that is presently going on uh, which uh, has been going on for a while i think as, as you all know and uh, so i so i'm i'm involved in the case and i've been in court for most of, of the days in the case and, and i remember that that on the i think on the first day or something when they were still uh, they were still hammering out what the exact contours of the case were there was a back and forth between the solicitor general and the chief justice uh, where uh, the chief justice and i think everyone everyone would have not, would have seen this because it it just went viral uh, where he basically said like he basically made the uh, trans solidarity statement 101 when he said that uh, you know it <coughs> uh genitalia do not uh, determine in absolute terms uh, gender right so i'm just putting it very simply i'm i'm sort of doing it in a reductive way but effectively that is a very basic uh, trans solidarity statement that he made in response to something which was general said and uh, the the trolling that then took place uh, of of him uh, was uh, was i mean it was a level of viciousness that that was quite striking to see you know i i was i was taken aback by it and i've and i've seen i've seen like both this particular judge and others as well also being trolled before uh, but this was of a of a level that was organized and ambitious and, and was was quite striking now of course that is going to affect uh, how next time you know both like both what he will say in in court um, and the way that you as as a counsel uh, will uh, will pitch the argument right so so that affects it directly because you know that that uh, your what you say can be snipped you, you can have like a 10 second video of it that is snipped and and put out of context and that could then lead to to well both a certain kind of trolling but also uh, as in, in today's climate uh, it, it you know these things can easily spill, spill out of of the online sphere and it's, it's that's something you're always aware of So I think in that sense there is a definite chilling effect in in how you pitch arguments in court because you you know you know that that there there is now a, a very wide um, audience that reacts in certain ways that are antithetical to a free exchange of ideas. So I think that's that's one thing. And the second, of course, is that um, that recent high-profile contempt of court cases that actually have to do with uh, criticisms of the court. in the sense that the court has become uh you know uh, insufficiently uh, able to uh, confront the executive on matters of fundamental rights uh, have of course led to a chilling effect in that now every time you write something about the court you you think five or six times you know is this not only do you think to yourself is this contempt because you know the law of contempt is is, is clear cut in that the law is applied properly you can tell you can it's very easy to not do contempt of court under the formal legal definition of contempt of court but now you are thinking not only that you know is my is my statement legally uh, on the right side but also that is it possible that you know it could be taken to be on the wrong side you know and so and then you think two or three times before you actually couch it and you in many times you end up being you know uh more circumspect than you would have liked to be because as i said uh, you know in a in a previous comment a new law is being made on, made on the fly so uh, as you can never tell what the law you thought you knew whether it will still be the law tomorrow when your case comes to court right so then you end up engaging in precisely what the chilling effect is that you you stay well clear of that line like very well clear and therefore you end up censoring yourself even in speech that would otherwise be legal or or lawful Uh, so I think we touched upon this a little bit earlier, um, but 
Gautam, could you just tell us, like, you've, you've, we've talked about this, how, you know, uh, journalists are detained, journalists are charged with sedition, charged with defamation. How exactly do you think the law is sort of used as this tool to kind of bludgeon or blunt the freedom of the press? Yeah, so I think that, that as I said earlier, there's a range of laws, right? And now, so one, of course, is the existence of all these laws. That is the problem. Um, now, that is one thing. The second thing is that the legal processes, and and I, this is not really I mean, something everyone knows. Right? So I'm, I'm, there's no need to dwell upon it too much. But that ca- classical phrase, the process is the punishment, right? Just to repeat that. It is very true in, in India because what happens is that that you know you have the FIR, right? And then you know you are basically going from court to court. Uh, I think the, again, the Rahul Gandhi thing right now is instructive, right? So you begin with this defamation case in um, in uh, uh, Gujarat. The next thing you know, that two or three other defamation cases is going from from place to place, uh, and maybe possible for him given you know existing wealth and all of that. But it's not possible for people who don't have that kind of wealth. Right. So, so it's that the FIR will be filed, and then you go and you go here, and you go there, uh, and and again, like th- there is no certainty that 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 you know, if you were to do everything by the book, that you would actually get quick relief, right? So, if you think of uh, of Munawar Faroqi, right, and and this again belongs to the realm of of art. So, Jain Krishna sir, you know, directly applicable. Um, he had to go all the way to the Supreme Court to get relief on. A statement he didn't even make, but was apparently going to make. And so the guy was was in jail, um, and he was denied bail by the trial court, by the high court, and finally had to go to the Supreme Court, uh, all the way up there, to uh, to to just get like something that basic. And even there, like you get lucky in that your case goes before you know Justice Nariman, Rohinton Nariman, who on these issues was a fairly strong-minded judge. I can imagine, I can well imagine a number of judges on the court right now who would not be this sympathetic. Uh, and in fact, may well have replicated what, uh, catered what happened in, in the high court and the trial court. So again, this is just a matter of luck that uh, the case was assigned by the Chief Justice to a judge who was on this issue a good judge. Uh, so I think that, that that is the issue. So not, it's not just a web of laws, sedition, 153A, 95A, uh, all of that. It's also that... Uh, once they, once the, once the police and the FIR, no, so that law comes into force, you have no guarantees of how long it will take to get out. And even if you will get out, right? So you can, you could well see court after court just keeping you in jail. Uh, so that is the problem, right? and, and that is one what, what we say because it's actually now it's not just. So earlier we said uh, process is the punishment in the sense that you will have to go from place to place, be harassment and all that. Now. The process is literally punishment. You'll be in jail, right? And and you don't know when you'll, when you'll get out. So I think that is that is the problem. Uh, so Team Krishna, so I kind of want to turn to what Gautam said about the process being the punishment. Uh, here, not in terms of the law, but in terms of how uh, you are as an artist and a public figure. So uh, with the internet, uh, there's also unparalleled access to artists, journalists, writers, um, and often we can see that journalists especially those of marginalized identities, are on the receiving end of vitriolic attacks. Um, in the case of Munawar Furuki, uh, you know, boycotts, things like that. How do you think that contributes to the chilling effect? Uh, tremendously. Uh, it not only affects that individual, but it affects the entire ecosystem that is in which that individual operates. Um, it's with, uh, whether it's Munawar Furuki or it's, you know, Stand up comedy could be music, it could be a dancer. Um, so the moment, say, X is attacked um, for the way they express the art or they said something, could be anything, it affects the entire ecosystem. Organizers are affected. Organizers don't want to call that person. It's a direct assault also on their livelihood. Let's not forget that there is livelihood involved in this. There is emotional, there is freedom of expression, there is, of course, Article 21, there is all all those ethical constitutional aspects, but there is also an economic livelihood aspect. And the more and, and as an artist, if you don't have the privilege of comfort and cushion economically and socioeconomically, um, it this will hit you very, very badly. You will lose opportunities. 
people would not want to call you because they are afraid that they're going to lose money they're afraid they're going to get attacked they are afraid people are afra- afraid that auditoriums are going to get attacked and a lot of this is also happening through threats and i have faced this so i can say this quite confidently on how it really affects the ecosystem uh, not once or twice but multiple times there have been cases i have faced situations where the auditorium is called the manager has been called and said we will break the auditorium down organizers are called and said you have no business organizing excess concert if you do this will happen that will happen um and these are personal attacks these are uh, threats and immediately i can and i i can take the you know position and say fine if you feel this way that's okay don't organize the concert i can say but that not everybody can do so the entire ecosystem of music in my case or or carnatic music or it could be any other form music or theater or or stand up comedy you only then will have people who are brave enough to stand up to these forces and like we both gautam and i said these are not just forces of law these are forces of law these are forces of the police these are forces beyond these structures these are unknown names and also we see more and more that we can't separate the we should shouldn't have ever but now we know more clearly the virtual world and the real world they feed off each other they are not separate entities at some point of time you could just say trolling or bad attacks on on a saver an activist not just an artist on social media is uh, a virtual thing i am not going to discuss the, the the emotional trauma and the psychological trauma that it causes but i'm just keeping that aside for now but a lot of that is then transferring to s- people attacking these individuals attacking their space of work attacking their space of performance in the physical real world and this we are seeing more and more in operation uh, again i have personal experience of that so uh, it is a situation where we actually do not know how we can handle it either we say we don't want to in a way express ourselves and that's where self censorship comes but also if your livelihood is going to be affected if you're not going to say we have spaces to sing spaces to dance spaces to uh, express yourself as a comedian or whatever you lose that one thing that you're doing in your life and that chilling effect completely destroys the spirit of any individual therefore the the plan that is in operation when people attack a performance space an artist is not just about the artist we should keep that in mind attacking one person is a message for everybody else that's the plan it's a message for everybody else to say shut up to say you can't say this say you can't sing this it is also an attack on organizers on sponsors how many cases can i tell you where sponsors have got calls saying that they should not give money for a performance of an ex artist performance of a some troupe there are there are many examples that i know personally of where then the end, you're basically breaking the life of artists and i want to just end by saying one thing that the whole role of art and the press if i may bring the two together in a very unusual uh combination is to ask questions and ask difficult questions difficult questions can be direct they can be actual questions asked by a reporter they can be a tune they can be an, a rhythm that's never been heard or a, a a melody that is marginalized they could be questions of a work of art from the past these are questions of to society questions to ourselves questions to people and if this entire this whole question of this index that we are discussing today our slide in the index is a slide in our ability to be critical thinking citizens and fear is what is replacing critical thinking and therefore everything from the social to the economic is being targeted so i think we've discussed from you know several facets and different perspectives what exactly is going on with press freedom and by extension uh, the freedom of expression in india i want to end on a slightly more hopeful note if that's possible uh, i want to know what both of you think about what we can do to 
keep this freedom of expression alive uh, to preserve press freedom in this country as a lawyer as an artist what you think we can do uh, gotham would you like to go first i well, that's a that's a difficult question um, i i think that uh, i think for this as always lessons are to be drawn from previous contexts and of course no one context is uh, is is the same but the issues that we are facing are not new either they have been faced in in society is before and and society is today and 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 on going forward as well and and there have been many different forms of of opposition to a broad climate of censorship so there is of course the uh, samizdat method in the soviet union where you know like you you pass around things by hand if necessary and of course that has changed now there are other ways to do it uh, but uh, you know a way of of communication that it goes outside of of sort of the permitted channels um, as as a lawyer i mean obviously you um, i think the important thing is that you have to understand that uh, that uh, the the courts are are forums that you you can't do without because because you can't wish them away they exist but at the same time you have to be intensely pragmatic and uh, and uh, strategic about how you uh, approach how and when you approach the courts and there are occasions where not going to court is a better option and will do less damage than going to court so i think that that uh, and that uh, any such decision of 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 activating the court as a forum has to obviously be be taken uh, after consultation and and discussions and you know a uh, just uh, a collaboration and i think that that uh, there are many books uh, most recent one i read was a book uh, mandela brief about lawyering in apartheid south africa which show that that there are always cracks in in these systems and and the and the, the purpose of strategy and and uh, and pragmatism is to to be able to find the crack and to be able to widen the crack uh from time to time i think that's always possible that's always possible that's always doable uh so i think that yeah that is the somewhat hopeful hopeful note in which i will i will end i right, it's a very difficult question to answer actually uh or i mean we all like to have hope and i i, I sincerely hope we can find a way it's of course these are experiences that have been there in the past the uh, society and artists and the press have all felt it in the past uh but that's not a good enough uh, explanation for it to be so active and enforced in such an ugly manner today the two things that i i believe that we need to forge uh the one thing we need to forge is collectives and i'm i think the coming together of people and i'm talking about people of diverseness people of diverse communities diverse um ideas of india too ideas of even diverse ideas of freedom maybe you know but that we need collectives where we come together because we believe in certain basic principles of democracy certain basic principles of freedom of privacy and i i want to use that word uh, privacy and i think we have to create more such collectives and they don't have to be necessarily public things the other thing we always talk about you know safe spaces we need many safe spaces where we can even talk about this privately where there's no violence and violence in word violence in expression violence of all or in any kind of form not just the physical and i think that's very important for us because i think it's only through that energy that can be really constantly you know find gaps and go through those gaps and i think it's important for this and this is a bit tricky but it's still important for us to maybe at times set aside certain differences and i'm i'm saying this with care um, we can discuss what these differences could be but i think maybe it is also important that we consider that not that we are saying that we will not have those battles with each other but maybe we also need to strategize on those battles sometimes i feel especially the way social media operates we are all reacting um to various situations and various triggers right sometimes maybe we should not react to certain triggers because we need to wait for to take up that battle just like you wait to decide for what you need to go to court 
I think you need to also strategize on this. So that kind of a negotiation, which is a complicated negotiation, also needs to be there in society as citizens, as artists, etc. The second thing is what disappoints me uh, a great deal in today's environment is the way most people with any kind of socio-economic political power in this country behave. There seems to be no intention to engage with the problem that is hitting us, that has hit the ceiling. And that, I think, needs to change. People with any kind of power must find their own ways. I'm not saying they all need to make public statements. I'm not saying they all need to be activists and on the street. I'm not saying that. But I think if if we as people with social power are not willing to take that little chance uh, in whatever way we can, then we are failing the many who can't take any chance. And I, therefore, I think there's a lot. I, I'm, I, I would think there's a lot of responsibility uh, in, in many of us um, to take that step forward and contribute to this discourse and not hide and slink away, uh, especially when things are as ugly as they are today. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, and with that, we're coming to the end of this evening's spaces. Uh, thank you, TM Krishna, sir, Gautam, for joining us today. Uh, it was incredibly enlightening to have to be able to have this conversation with you. Uh, I think it was also really important that we were able to do this. And thank you, everyone, for spending your Friday evening with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, events like this, um, spaces to have conversation like this, would not be possible without the support of our members and donors. Uh, if you're interested on our work on censorship and free expression, please visit our website. Uh, and if you can, please donate and become a member. We would really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thanks.